this is a poem that I wrote mm, actually probably about 10 days ago. And I have been having a hard time writing these days and it's not something um, that's uncommon, I think. Uh, many people who have, you know, been maybe fairly prolific in their writings or speakings have found themselves just stopping and being stopped and looking for some way of reorienting. And, uh, and I've been fine to, um, it's been unsettling, but just to leave that space as it is and not be scurrying to some um, okayness. I'm not okay. It's not okay. <laughs> Things aren't okay. So, so I, I wrote this and it seemed to really um, strike a chord for many people when they wrote it, uh, when, sorry, when they read it. Um, it will happen in a time of blueberries and corn and the dead returning as hummingbirds, as a morning sun glows white through a thick blanket of pale gray lit clouds and much will have stopped. A pandemic unrest will bring hesitation. Can I touch you? Can I touch you? And even bigger questions that won't go away, pressing you for answers that offer no solace. How then shall I live? Where do I die? Where are my grandchildren? What have we done? And you won't know if you should pick up your knitting or read more about ice melting or clean your kitchen or tend to your garden or speak with your ancestors or lie down on the earth and cry or write a love letter. I'm Dean Walker and welcome to the Poetry of Predicament podcast a podcast for people brave enough to face humanity's challenges and problems, and most importantly, our numerous predicaments. The Poetry of Predicament is a podcast meant to inspire us to bring forth grace, beauty, and connection with the web of life in the face of a predicament-laden world. After a couple of decades of facilitation and teaching and a decade of learning with Stephen Jenkinson, Poet Rochelle Lamb shares some of her wisdom and some of her humor. Yeah, Rochelle Lamb. You have a sense of a direction. Okay, um, well, I'll go with the first question, which was, um, you know, how, how did I find you was through uh, a video that you had done, well, a podcast not that long ago with Dar Jamail. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, so it, it was that, it was the way that you were speaking um, mm -hmm. with each other so candidly about your lives and what's, you know, what this pandemic is, is doing um, yeah. Or, or, yeah, how it's affecting you, impacting you and how you're seeing, really how you're seeing. And so, and I also was drawn to, well, the poetry of predicament, the, that <laughs> title, which is great because I love poetry. Um, and then when I looked back, I saw some of the other things that you've done, and I noticed that you had highlighted a, a talk that Stephen Jenkinson had done. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know when he, the, he did that talk uh, interview, I guess sometime um, after the pandemic had begun. Mm. You highlighted some excerpts from that. Right. You know, really just speaking so clearly about what's going on. So you were struck by that. And then when I went back even a little further, I saw that you had some involvement with uh, an interest in nonviolent communication. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so that's when I went, wow, that's very interesting. These three things right. coming together, um, because that's what I've been doing is teaching nonviolent communication for the past 20 years. Wow. I, studying with Stephen Jenkinson for the past 10 and uh, and I've also been writing poetry a lot and I look at how things are and uh, it doesn't look good for us <laughs> put it that way mm -hmm. 
uh, it does, you know, I've heard you use the word collapse um, several times. All right. Um, and so, so that's why I thought it'd be great to talk uh, just about yes. these things. Yes. You know? and, um, and for me in particular, where I, I'm at is, it has been uh, related to my work in nonviolent communication and wanting to, or I, I've made every effort and uh, there's more to be done to, to uh, make that work more relevant to the urgency that you speak about. Mm -hmm. So I'm not convinced, for instance, that it's a really a good idea for, uh, for me anyway, to be giving workshops about how to get along with others without including that larger component, which I do believe is actually um, at the root of the discord. So I spend a lot of time looking at disconnection yeah. instead of connection, uh, because I think if we don't look at the disconnection, all of the tools we overlay on top of it just yeah. maintains the disconnection. It just looks better for a little while. But... Yeah the disconnection and our way of life continues unchanged yeah. really yeah. essentially so um yeah i'm trying to be a better uh better at diagnosing what's going on so whenever i work with people i basically say hey i, I don't think you've got the diagnosis right you know you think it's you you think it's the other person no it's neither one of you it's you living in crazy time that's yeah. what Going on. So if you if you don't let that in, you know, I mean, it's good news and it's bad news. The good news is it's not your fault. The bad news is you got a, a lot of work to do. Mm. <laughs> you know, so and uh, yeah. Well, one one piece you just shared uh, about the disconnection mm -hmm. and and really telling the truth about that uh, at an extraordinary level is is the only place to start. Um, you've just saved yourself about 18 bucks and, and a few days of reading if you ever wanted to read my, my book, The Impossible Conversation. That's, that's the center of my work is I'm asserting that what got us into this predicament is that we've disconnected from every primary source of meaning and right relationship in mm -hmm. human life. From deeper self, each other, earth and soul. And... Uh, that the only thing that's worthy of getting out of bed in the morning for these days is whatever my personal gathering of practices for reconnection, uh, whatever inspirations that come out of those self-selected practices, that's the foundation for getting out of bed and and being an expression of presence in this world. So again, I think we're I think we're gonna have plenty to talk about. Rochelle Lamb, thank you for reading that recent poem from you. And welcome to the Poetry of Predicament podcast. <laughs> we were just talking before we hit the record button and I was telling you how I was moved when we first contacted, when you first wrote an email to connect and, and uh, you led with something about your poetry and I was moved then and I'm actually moved now. Mm -hmm. And just after you've read what you've read, it gave me a chance to slow down, to pause uh, and to feel. These are all good things. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm really pleased to make your acquaintance. It's good to meet you and uh, remarkable to feel how much overlap and resonance there seems to be in our two different orientations to the world and our presence in the world, whatever we're doing. You know, we do different things, but it seems like there's an awful lot of uh, overlap. I'm particularly pleased because uh, there, there's a new level a new emphasis in these podcasts that I think you picked up on when you mentioned the couple of uh, earlier interviews that you've seen and some things caught your eye. Mm -hmm. And uh, those things are part of the emphases of 
last year, 2019, and even further into this year and beyond is to um, bring forth voices of people who have something to say from a rather extraordinary yet very mundane, very normal, very much accessible to all of us, but so rare, so rarely accessed by many of us. And that I would call the, the implicit senses, not the normal five that we are so sure of ourselves in, but the implicit senses that seem to be accessed by poetry like yours and uh, a number of other kinds of work that tend to uh, place their emphasis on relationship, powerful inner messages that come from when we inhabit ourselves really directly. Those implicit senses, senses seem to live somewhere in that core. <laughs> this is definitely a, a bit more leaning on and uh, even starting out with a stance in those implicit senses this morning in this interview uh, than, than usual. So uh, I'm happy about that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm appreciating your reaching out, um, really appreciating this opportunity for us to share and speak. So I've just said a few things to kind of introduce and open the space and to acknowledge and thank you for your, both your reaching out and your opening this up with that lovely piece of writing. Um, I think I'm gonna stop there. And I would ask that you please introduce yourself as you would like to be known. Mm, as I would like to be known. <laughs> That might not be who I am, though. <laughs> that works for me. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, maybe it, it will be helpful just to say that, yeah, for the past 20 years, I've been, I've been teaching nonviolent communication, which was one of the reasons why I approached you. I saw that you had some interest in that. Um, and... I am also, uh, I, I've also been studying with uh, Stephen Jenkinson for the past 10 years. And, and then I, I see what's happening right now in the world. And uh, one of the things that uh, strikes me is that uh, we're not that good at, I would say deep relating. I think we're probably not that bad at deep relating with other humans, but I'm not sure we're so good at deep relating with everything else that what I have found. And I think what my, um, my, what I'm trying to overcome in nonviolent communication is how much it keeps returning to human relationship. And I'm thinking, geez, it seems like there it's, we need to be relating with the bigger picture, um, with the non-human life, that if we were to accord as much importance to that, we would be freaking out that 60% of wildlife, for instance, had been wiped out in the past 50 years. But now just notice the difference between that being wiped out and what happens when human life is now uh, as it is threatened by a pandemic there's a, a very different kind of reaction that happens and so no wonder you know oh, we have people like Greta Thunberg saying how dare you because we don't pay attention often I say we and that's it's a very uh, you know I shouldn't say that but anyway there's a there's a lot of negative consequence accruing to the fact that uh, we carry on with our lifestyles as we do. And so, um, and yet there is a lot of, um, uh, there are a lot of challenges between humans. And I think they come back to the levels of disconnection that we uh, continually um, are living with. They were just so commonplace. They're so commonplace. And 
I mean, I, I, you've, I know you've seen this before. People have, a, they'll make up a, a poster and on one side of the poster is all these different uh, varieties of plants and trees. And on the other side are things like, um, you know, logos like Nike, McDonald's. And so which ones can you identify? And everyone knows the ones that are part of the, you know, dominant culture, but we don't actually know much about the real life that sustains us. That relationship is not that is 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 sorely um, missing, and if you don't have a relationship with the life that sustains you, one that's in a mutual accord and respect and courtesy and regard, um, then this makes it very easy for exploitation, destruction, da da da. And here we are, um, and. Uh, yeah, you know, and so many of the problems I think that people have with each other are are based on the fact that they're not in right relation with everything else around them, which is the you know the the world of plants, animals, stones, oceans, fish, etc., as well as the um, as well as the unseen world. You know, we could say our ancestors, for instance. Um, those not born yet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. You know, you mentioned something um, as you were first speaking about that projection of, well, first, the, just the, the statistic that we've lost uh, roughly two thirds of the biomass on the planet, uh, mm -hmm. the living biomass on the planet since since I was born anyway. I keep that uh, in, in my pocket, so to speak, with a number of other really critical measures of our impact to just keep myself awake. It sounds like you have a similar pocket with a, a few similar pieces of remembering. Mm -hmm what's what's actually going on and i'm curious i'm just sort of putting this out as a inquiry with you i'm i'm letting you know that that's that's something i need to keep doing is reaching into that pocket and reminding myself of what's actually going on because the the automaticity in my system i was i was born saturated by the business as usual mentality of separation and violence inherent violence and and so on i i had a good run i had a, a lifetime of doing corporate consulting where i was flying between gigs and all around the world and paid well sexy wow great and the whole time i knew in the background i knew in my heart of hearts i knew and so I'm curious, do you have anything like that in yourself of just noticing what you might still be shaking off in terms of the business as usual saturation, how, mm -hmm. how it affected you and your growing up and your lifestyle? And, and perhaps could you share a little bit about what helps you shake it off, what helps you stay awake and stay engaged and uh, presenced the way you are? Mm. Well, that's a great question. <laughs> um, you know, it, I'm thinking about uh, when I was about six or seven years old and uh, my father and uh, my mother and, and myself and my siblings, we all actually did move to the United States for four years. My father took on a, a job. And um, so we were living in Portier in Michigan. And that's when I started school. And I went to a Roman Catholic school. And uh, this story I think is, is very relevant to what you've just asked me because uh, we were living right on the lake and it was, it was fairly rural. Um, 
So I went to school and then I remember this, uh, the beginning of a, what I will call an indoctrination. I know it happened before, indoctrinations happening all the time. And, you know, we're always being fed something and some of it is life serving and some of it isn't. Okay, so here we go. I'm being told that, um, you know, human beings sin at least seven times a day. I mean, at least a saint does. And so the mere mortals are sitting way more than that. So this is my, you know, introduction to, you know, the, the, the sacrament of confession. And, um, and so we're going to uh, be going through that sacrament. We'll be anointed and, and have the first confession. And I actually remember uh, making things up about what I had done wrong uh, so that I could do the confession. I didn't recall having done the things I said, but I just picked up things like, you know, I, I hit my brother, I, I talked back to my parents, which I probably did at some point, but I just had no memory of having done it. Um, so I went through that, and, and along with those lessons were... We would, we would get shown these like slide, old slides, you know, when they used to do old slides as opposed to a, a Pixar production like uh, film. So this was about what happens to people when they go to hell. And I don't know what I was shown, but what I saw terrified me. I saw people like screaming in flames. Now, I don't know, you know, I think I was partly adding to it, you know, and I lost sleep over this stuff. And I couldn't even speak about it to my mother, who I was very close to. I, I, I was I was a very quiet child. I was very shy. First 21 years of my life, barely spoke at all. So, um, so I thought a lot about this at that age. And I recall walking home from school one day, uh, and it was spring was just coming. And the winters are long and hard down there. There's a lot of snow. And, you know, when you're a kid and spring is coming and you smell the, the grass coming up and you hear the robins and the trees are just like, oh, just blossoming. I remember just being struck by just the, the beauty of all of that. And, and I, I started to do a comparison here. At that age, I was thinking, wow, look, I can smell this. I can feel it. I can touch it. I can, it's, it's here. It's this, this world is all here. And I'm having a hard time connecting it with what they're telling me back there. I don't know how to do that. So one of them has to go. And I made a choice. And I've always been doing that. I seem to have been born in this world with an eye for um, like incongruity or things that just don't match up. And, you know, also my parents would, uh, we ordered, uh, well, they ordered uh, National Geographic magazines. So I would go through those and I'd be seeing pictures of people living different ways around the world. I was always struck with uh, like a tribal way of living, you know, and uh, and so I I thought wow they look at their eyes they're so bright the the people look like they look like they're part of the place that they come from and I didn't get that sense from where I was so I actually felt very alone uh, as a child with all of this but I would think about these things so I don't think I I never got that seduced in a way. And, you know, I, I've had two children and they're, they're home birthed and homeschooled. Like I've had things to keep me kind of bound to keeping my eyes open, you know. It doesn't mean they never get closed, but I'm, I'm more um, awake or looking around. It seems like that was my job description when I arrived, I think. I, ca I can't get away from it. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm I'm hoping you don't mind if I just I'd like to take a little side loop here of yeah. what something you just mentioned. So you've you've uh, 
given birth to a couple of kids. Mm-hmm. You've raised them and you've raised them on this path that you have been describing some of some of how that path got started and and I'm delighted to hear that you've been seduced a whole lot less than apparently I have been <laughs> into the uh business as usual culture and I I don't know if you're aware that we've got a kind of a sister podcast to this one which is called uh, take my hand conscious parenting in a time of stolen dreams. Mm. And so I'm, I'm thinking maybe we should post this there too. And what I'd like to ask you about that is given you, you seem to have somehow kept a, a certain amount of your conscious awareness uh, distinct from that usual saturation in business as usual, and particularly in the parenting role, I might add, that's a tough one to keep any amount of that conscious awareness going. I'm wondering if you could share anything about how you've actively over the years um, brought that your particular awareness as you wanted to share it with your children, as you saw what they were growing up into. Is this making sense as a question? Yeah, I think I, I see where you're heading. Maybe you're wondering too how, how they're doing. <laughs> I'd love to know that, sure. Anything you'd like to share? I, I think they're doing a, um, as poorly a, as well as any other, you know, grown up is at this time. Um, the that old you know the the expression it takes a village to raise a child uh it's just as true now as it's always been and so so i'm not sure of what my influence has been it, it's hard to know because it also seems like it's no matter what you do no matter uh what your parenting is you're not alone and i don't mean that in um this is not a good thing right now to what i'm saying (laughs) is that is that there are all these other forces out there i have no idea for instance how parents these days um deal with uh devices um you know with the the smartphone and what that does to a human being and what that does to a child my childhood and my grandchildren's childhood are vastly different. And I, I don't know what you can do to, um, uh, to mitigate the consequences of that, other than you know, expose children as much as you can to a natural world. Um, but it's, uh, I have a, I have a a lot of uh, mourning, I would say, that in spite of my efforts, and by the way, I'm not saying anybody should do what I did. I still don't know, <laughs> you know? I would say, I would say having, you know, uh, birthed my children at home, um, and I, you know, because I, I, I could, I, you know, I, my body worked that way, and so I could do that. Um, whether or not homeschooling is the best thing, uh, I think for some it is, for others, maybe not. Uh, you know, I'm struck by right now, there's a lot of conversation about back to school, isn't there? Are, are the schools reopening? Is it safe for kids to go to school? Uh, you know, what about their immune systems? Yada, yada. All of that's going on. And and I'm struck at how uh, how much automatic pilot you can see is in effect, in the sense that I don't hear anybody stopping and asking the question, geez, the world is changing so rapidly. And if we just sit down and do an inventory of what our impact is and what the future may look like um, based on what we've seen happening over the past, say, 100 years, what might be a good thing for our kids to know instead of proceeding with the curriculum as if 
as if what? What what are we preparing the children for? You know, if it was my school, I'd be doing a completely different thing. It would be, okay, you need to respond to what's happening here and now. And um, is there anybody in this room who does not know how to grow food? Because that's where I'd be starting. Yeah. I appreciate where you went with that because that that is the direction I was I was hoping you'd talk about and and perhaps just one level more specific. Um, some of the words that I use an awful lot in uh, I'm putting together some online video learning series for people who are kind of new to the idea of being collapse aware mm -hmm. and how to prepare what are the some what's some of the inner work that can be done how can we reconnect with those primary sources of meaning that we talked about before and so on and so since you've got adult children now and you're you're on the track that you are in in response <clears throat> where you were just talking about uh, how you'd be adjusting the curriculum if it was up to you in local schools and so on. Um, could I ask what, what sort of practices or rituals or habits have you developed over the years? And perhaps you could share some that you've seen in your own children and perhaps now in grandchildren what sort of life affirming practices, habits, and so on for reconnection, for self regulation, for co regulation, for um, staying connected with one another and with deeper self? Um, any any of those kind of of practices, either individual or, or shared practices that you could tell us about? Yeah, well, I, I, I don't use the word practices and that's probably because I'm not, um, I, I, don't, I don't do these things regularly. Yeah, um, sure. But, but I'll tell you what I do. Yeah. And uh, I, I mean, let's say I, if I'm having a, a very, if I'm really challenged about what's going on, um, and I don't know how to go on. I go lie on the earth. That's what I do. I just lie down. And um, it will be just, it would just be, I just go walk right out my back door and lie down and stay there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it could be going for walks. That sounds sort of just uh, whatever. Um, but, also, what I try to do is, is anything uh, tactile things, so knitting. Yeah. I didn't used to knit, um, but I started knitting because I realized that was something that both of my grandmothers did. And pretty much anybody, you know, if you check in, those, there's something that they've done like that, knitting or weaving. And uh, I come from an Irish, Welsh, and French um, you know, ancestry. And when I look at the photographs of the people, you know, in the 1800s, almost all the time, women are sitting down with knitting needles and a ball of wool, and they're knitting. And so this is a way for me to connect with them. Mm -hmm. Because I'm trying to make my connections uh, go beyond the human. Sure, I can call up a friend and, you know, cry on somebody's shoulder. Uh, yeah, and that's lovely. Um, but I think that a lot, of, as I tried to say earlier, a lot of the disconnection has to do with them being disconnected from everything else. And I'm forgetting what feeds me. And also really taking uh, pleasure um, when I cook is to, you know, the, if, if you've got a garden, which I had a garden this year, like everything that comes out of there to really connect with the you know the smell of a fresh tomato boy is just it's just heavenly and and that starts to that's what has been feeding me and you see that i think the thing is that it's so easy to become um you know pissed off 
things aren't working my way. My needs aren't getting met. Uh, you know, and what you hear, you know, I'm, I'm trying to inflect a certain tone to that, which is entitlement. No, I was never entitled to begin with. So why am I speaking like that now? Instead of a deep humility, which, you know, humility comes from the root of it is humus, which is earth. So get back out there, get down on your knees, you know, kiss the, the skin of the earth, you know, kiss her shoulders, kiss, just do it. And so that would be my, my practice. Another one is my writing, is to write. Now I have to be careful because when I write poetry, I find that to be, it's like an exhale and oh, okay, that's great. But the other kind of writing I also do is about, you know, is about my uh, study and work in nonviolent communication and trying to kind of turn it, turn it and redirect it so that the needs that nonviolent communication keeps talking about are not seen primarily as human. That life has needs. And if I, I want to attend to that. So when that kind of writing is a different kind of writing than the poetry. You know, it's, it's one where sometimes I just get a little, um, uh, I don't know, contracted, you know, because I'm just trying to make the point. <laughs> and it's, it can be so hard because there is, I think, um, there's a little bit of an expectation that things work out for people. I mean, nonviolent communication, at least in the way I um, first learned about it, it was like, this was the thing you could do to get your needs met. But you see, that already is problematic. Who says my needs are supposed to be met all the time? Who's deciding what the needs are? Is it possible that through all my years of, of uh, being on, you know, in this dominant culture, I don't understand what needs are? When... You know, the need for comfort, for instance, or safety could be really blown out of proportion. Is that possible? I might be well served and life might be well served by me wondering about that. So I wonder about these things because I notice what, what it can start to do to people uh, to think that their needs are the driving force and must be attended to and feelings as well, you know, because in, in, in many modalities, if you don't feel good, that's a sign that something's not right. Maybe it's just a sign that that's how things are right now. Maybe you're not supposed to have what you want all the time. You know, that's the, so that's still part of the question. I'm kind of veering off a little bit now in terms of my practices, but, but that's uh, something else. I, I wonder a lot. I, I, I would say that is a, definitely an ongoing practice for me. Yeah. So that's why I've got these lines here. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, as, as you were talking about um, what I would call practices and you would call the things you do to be able to go on when sometimes it doesn't feel like you can go on. As someone you know better than I, has, is prone to saying, I can't go on, I go on. Yes. You know? <laughs> uh, yeah. I really appreciate your dipping us into that well that you, that you go to, to, to bring yourself back to wholeness, back to connection. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I, I would actually love to go more in the direction that you uh, finished up with there about your uh, your leaning these days with regard to nonviolent communication and some of the core tenets there that that it is uh, has always been founded on, <clears throat> and I I um, I'm not an expert by any stretch in nonviolent communication, but there's there are a tremendous number of similar methodologies mm -hmm. that um, I've been very actively kind of sorting through to find what are the elements that are particularly useful now in the calling of these times. Because mm -hmm. as I mentioned before, I, you know, I am a firm 
um, experiencer, not just believer, but a firm experiencer that, that these times are the real deal. These are the times that we've hopefully been preparing for, that we've been doing the inner work for, that we've been diving deep into finding out how to integrate our shadow in a good way, how to uh, bring ourselves to presence volitionally um, in the face of larger and larger stressors. This is the time. It's really mm -hmm. happening. So there was something about how you were discerning that when you're talking about your work with nonviolent communication that I, uh, I really appreciate. It's rare that I'm speaking with um, thought leaders these days, uh, facilitators, teachers, and so on, that are doing that kind of really deep looking, re-looking, re to see how are the core assumptions of this work doing? Mm -hmm. How am I doing with them? What's my experience of them? What's alive? And what's not apparently so current or alive? And so I, I again, really appreciate what you were mentioning. And uh, I guess along the lines of perhaps Derek Jensen is my strongest influence in terms of uh, the myth of human supremacy and mm -hmm. what a deeply, deeply ecocidal uh, and violent uh, belief structure, I don't, I don't know what else to call it, that, that that is. And so again, I'm just really applauding your looking at the core pieces of something as apparently, you know, kind of it's up on a pedestal. It's, it's such a, a long-standing, uh, very positive way for people to get trained into methodology of, of connection and of positive uh, relationship with one another and so on. Um, and and you're, I like the way you're prodding it in, in a way that probably not everybody's really thrilled for you to be prodding there. <laughs> no, I don't think they are. <laughs> Would, would you mind just sharing a little bit about what you've seen in terms of your own process and then when you've tried to share it with others in that community, how's it going? Um, when, I, when I share my work in, in my community where I live and uh, people usually come to me because they've heard about what I'm doing, um, if I have people for two days, you, that's typically what I'll do. Is if it, it's a two-day workshop, or you know, sometimes I, once a year I teach at Hollyhock, and that's for five days, which is like Canada's version of Esalen. Say, um, the first day is always a little bit like unsettling for people, usually, um, because I'm I'm speaking about other things, you know, and they're kind of waiting for well, what about me? And I'm like, no, this is about you. You're in the thing that we're talking about. It's not like we live, um, you know, isolated and in complete isolation and orbiting around this thing that we are kind of got feeding tubes to. It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we're asking the question should be troubling in and of itself, you know, because look where we are. So, um, but, but I would say, generally speaking, people uh, are very appreciative of it because it's not like we don't, we're not going to talk about the person at home who's not helping you with the housework. We're going to talk about that, but we're going to talk about it with the understanding of how challenging life is for all of us right now and what's occurring. We're not going to speak like we, uh, like we don't know what's happening. I'm not going to let that happen. And if you don't know what's happening, you're about to find out. <laughs> that's, that's how it goes. So uh, I find that it, it's, uh, it's welcomed by people. Um, it's also a challenge, of course, but it's welcomed. Um, within the NVC community, I have a different sense about that. Um, and, and I, I, I don't know, it, you know, it wouldn't be fair for me to say, cause I haven't had a lot of conversations with people, but you know, there are email threads and there is a community of people. And I've just simply noticed that when I write things, 
there seems to be just a big silence afterwards. <laughs> so, um, because I, I do think it's really important. Like for me, my work right now is to attend to what's needed now. It's really not about mm, my needs in the sense of what would give me great happiness, you know, but, but it also is in the sense of to, to be able to contribute. I mean, Marshall Rosenberg would say that the highest need is to contribute. That's what I'm doing. And to contribute, it's not about my inner passion or what I'm good at. I, I like to say this, imagine you're on the Titanic because we are here on the Titanic. And it, it's a great metaphor. You, you've hit the iceberg and uh, this ship is sinking. What are you doing? Are you taking workshops about personal development? Are you building boats? Um, are you letting others know that there isn't a rescue boat coming? Like there's so many different things that can be happening. Are you playing a musical instrument? You know, are you, and you go, okay, well, this is what I can do. I'm gonna play music while this goes down. It's, it's such an amazing story, really. And, and I, I'm very interested in that story because I don't see it as much different of what's happening now. I don't know, I don't know why it takes so much, you know, speaking about it. It's just obvious. Here's one, one a plan I would have. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if you stop waste management, uh, really quickly you start to see your impact <laughs> because it, doesn't, it won't disappear, you know? Or as, uh, was her name, Julia Butterfly, who, you know, who lived in the, the tree, Luna, for two years. She, you know, she has a little video um, clip where she says, when we say we're going to throw something away, where is a way? <laughs> where is that place? Well, we see pictures of it now. It's all the plastic bags in the ocean or wrapped around a turtle or, you know, it, it's, that's where a way is. It's the landfills. It's it's people in developing countries, the kids going through there and getting poisoned by the toxins inside of electronic devices. I mean, that's where it is. And if you just say no, what you create is now in your backyard. Okay, I mean, first of all, it's not, we can't do it because we've gone way past that point, but it's good to know it. I think it's important to know it, to realize, wow, Geez, yeah, it, we have enormous consequence and I'd like to increasingly have a, you know, a positive one that's more in the area of beauty making uh, instead of beauty taking mm. uh, or, or wiping it out, turning, making things uh, just ugly, um, you know. Yeah, I mean, we have a need for beauty but one of the things I'll, I'll just to to come back to this question of of teaching nonviolent communication. I remember in um, the early days when Marshall was still alive, and somebody asked Marshall in a workshop, "Marshall, what's it going to take, like, to change how things are? You know, the direction that we're going." And his answer really struck me. He said, "Mourning, a lot of mourning. Um, it's grief work, and." So what I'm, that's what I do in my, you know, in, when people are working with me, I'm trying to teach grief, but no, no, but I want a solution. Yeah, but what if there isn't one right now? You know, what if right now there isn't? Would you like me to share an example of, um, you know, I did mention like, you know, getting somebody to help out at home and how this all connects, because it does. So, so you walk into the house and, you know, somebody's just not, you've got a teenager and uh, you can see evidence of them all over the place in the kitchen, you know, a bag of chips opened, uh, you know, dirty dishes, that kind of thing. And so you could practice nonviolent communication by saying, you know, when I, when I walk into the house, and this would be after one workshop, let's say. So... We're going to go through observation, feeling, need, requests. When I walk into the house and I see, 
your dishes on the counter and you on the laptop, I feel angry and frustrated because I have a need to trust that people will, uh, you know, follow up on the things they say they're going to do. Let's imagine we just had a conversation about this two nights ago, that people are going to follow up and, and do the things they say they're going to do. And, uh, and, and I have a need for order. Would you be willing to, you know, stop doing that and come and attend to this, you know, within the, within the hour, we'll, we'll make it a kinder kind of thing, you know, not would you be willing to stop what you're doing right now, which would still be, um, it would be observing the four, you know, the four steps of NVC. But the deeper practice of NVC is one around connection. And you can start by recognizing, geez, living this way in a nuclear family is hugely disconnecting already, you know? So I want to bring as much aware awareness as I can to the poverty of the way we live, even though it looks great on some levels into that conversation. So my conversation will be a different one. It will be, you know, the other night when we spoke and you said you would pick up after yourself and you haven't done it, I noticed I was getting really angry when I saw it. But, and I'm wondering about, did you agree, you know, two nights ago because I'm your mom and you think that authority, you're supposed to do that or, I don't know how to proceed anymore at this time because I just want to trust that all of us in this house have an awareness about that we're living together under the same roof. And can you help me out here? What are your thoughts on what I'm saying? Like, I want to bring them into the dilemma, which extends way beyond the, the house or the kitchen. It's, it's a bigger thing than that. It's like, wow, it takes a village to raise a child, and here I am, it's just me and, and maybe dad or, or maybe just me. There's enormous poverty, and instead of insisting that things go our way, I think it's really useful to acknowledge the depth of poverty so that then it's like, yeah, geez, and it must be hard. Yeah, of course. What am I thinking that I would just leave all my stuff all over the house and that I'd be forcing my mom into a conversation? Well, that's what happens when you don't have a village. Because I tell you, there'd be somebody who'd be bold enough to say, hey, this, it doesn't work here. You see, we're all living together. So I think you can do it. So could you do it? It'd be more of a kind of a different way of thinking, you know, where the need for respect and courtesy and recognizing, you know, there's people on the planet who have more time in than I do as a teenager, you know, and uh, given that we don't have rights of initiation, you know, just giving somebody the keys to the car or getting your license or being able to vote, that's not it. Because the idea is your childhood is over and you're now in service to the world, but this is not the world we're living in. And so that's the, there's so many levels of disconnection that have occurred. I mean, I will say this in a workshop, I'll ask people, how many of you spent time in a crib? You probably don't remember, but if you did, I'm sure that uh, you probably were hoping for connection. This is uh, very unnatural to be separated in this way. It's very recent as well, although Fisher Price and those folks would have you think otherwise, but that's very recent. Yeah. So from the get go, separation, separation, you know, the whole, your whole world is oriented to your nursery and to the schedule of your bottle or, yeah. So that's a lot. And it's just goes right in there. Yeah. Download, download successful. <laughs> yeah, but there's enormous cost, you know, or if, you know, uh, I, I think a lot about price tags. When we go and buy something and we see the price tag, that price tag has just the dollar figure and a number. But that's not the truth. There's, no, no, I want to know, like, where was this made? Who's making it? What's happening to them? 
while they're making it. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what resources have been uh, just kind of like taken? And what about the shipping? Um, what's this going to cost my grandchildren or their children if they have some, you know? I don't know. So I'm, I'm very interested in, in um, more in consequence. If we could look and make a place for consequence, because instead we go to, no, I have a need for autonomy and freedom and for comfort. Okay, well, this is very costly. And it's not to say that people should be deprived of these things, but maybe we could lower our standards in some areas and raise them in others. Mm -hmm. This is one of the pleas I make, you know, when I'm working with people, it's like, let, if you orient that properly, you know, uh, you know, when we, we see the whole truth of a situation, I think we have a lot more compassion. So for me, the grief is where that compassion comes from. Um, it was, uh, here, I've got this quote here from Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, who's a, a poet and educator, an American poet and educator, who said, if we could read the secret history of our enemies, we should find in each man's life sorrow and suffering enough to disarm all hostility. So I make it a little more modern, you know, or inclusive, just saying, you know, if we could read the secret history of our enemies, friends, spouses, lovers, co-workers, children, da 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 we should find in each person's life sorrow and suffering enough to disarm all hostility. I mean, I'm all for, let's just sit down and have a big cry, <laughs> you know, and because there's something that is, is very, uh, there, there's a humility that's there and there's a sense of, um, of uh, often wonder is there too, because we just don't know how to proceed. It's very much the, I can't go on. I'll, I'll go on. I mean, I'm still breathing, right? My heart is still beating. I'm still breathing. Okay, let's go, you know, but Let's try not to, we don't have to go back to what's making us crazy. But I can see that that's what we're gonna do. I think, I mean, you can see it, right? That, that's, why, that's why the whole talk about hope, I go, no, I, it's like, what am I hoping for? Yeah. Yeah, I, it's just, you know, it doesn't mean much uh, to me. But there's a lot of work to be done. And, and I just mean it just trips from the day to day. You know, there's, there's mouths to feed, there's people to clothe, there's, there are people who are dying who need to be cared for, sick people, children, you know, there's all that, the food to grow, just for the, the mundane, the beautiful mundane. Yeah. Mm. That's gorgeous. Thank you. That was uh, a tour of some, some uh, very important ground. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Some things that, that uh, stuck out for me in what you just shared, you know, an emphasis on, on the truth, straight up you know, right at the beginning of any of these conversations. So I heard you mention that a few times. And I also heard you mention, I'm going to say it in my own words, but you um, talked about this, this imaginary um, instance of, you know, being in a community situation and having some behavior that just doesn't work. And how do you communicate about it? And how do you uh, bring it around so that it is not just somebody complying to force, but there's actually a, a way that it starts to to live as a motivator from a person's core mm -hmm. on their own. And, and it seems like there are a couple of ways in which that is an initiation into true adulthood, which so very few of us have you know better than I at this point after your study with Stephen Jenkinson it seems like that's an awful lot of what goes on in the orphan wisdom environment is uh, d distinguishing that process and a part of what you shared I 
my words for it is, is how are we deploying our attention? Given that how we attend, how we perceive the world and how we presence in the world is so central to if, if we are indeed an initiated adult, that means something, something tremendous inside of us has shifted in terms of how we deploy our attention. What do I see when I walk into the kitchen? Let's take it down to that level you were talking about before. If I walk into the kitchen and I'm leaving my bag of chips and I'm not doing you know, the dishes and I'm you know, basically leaving a mess for somebody else to keep track of, then I deploy my attention in a particular way. Mm-hmm. And what I was hearing you say from your obviously initiated adult point of view is there is another way of seeing. There's another way of deploying one's attention and a number of other elements that that make up an initiated human being that you're pointing to. And so I, you covered an awful lot of ground that I wanted to ask you about. So I really appreciate it because you saved me a lot of time in a, in a much more compact way. Uh, you also mentioned about the real costs of everything. Mm-hmm. And that's something that obviously we, at least in the USA, we seem to know the cost of everything and the value of nothing. And uh, that tends to lead to an ecocidal society. And uh, the last piece, I just, uh, I'm just doing this t- little tour of pieces that, that jumped out at me out of what you shared. The, the last piece I want to mention is Marshall's response to, to a question of, you know, are, are we going to make this? And, and if so, what do we need to do to, to make it to, to somehow move forward in a good way, closer together and, and possibly heal, possibly find some way of sustaining uh, both, both uh, human endeavors and, and the earth and its systems. And for his response to be grieving, to be grief, is um, not surprising uh, to me but just a beautiful affirmation of something that does keep resurfacing, has this regularity of showing up when questions of that depth are asked. It just keeps being one of the most frequent responses. So those are things that all really resonated for me. And what's clear to me is, at least I'm hoping it's clear for you too, and I hope uh, against hope that this is our, not our last conversation. It feels as if the envelope of this conversation is starting to draw to a close. I'm wondering if my little recap of just what nuggets jumped out at me, if they spark you in any particular way of, you know, I I guess the last remaining question I really wanted to ask you is, if you were speaking to a room full of folks who are newly aware of that level of truth that you've been talking about, that really needs to start out the collapse of our conversation, are there any uh, sharings that you could offer from your experience that you could offer to these folks to possibly round the edges a little bit, mm. maybe reduce the amount of unnecessary suffering a little bit. And, and I'm also drawn back to our original, before we got going on the recording, my invitation to you to share from your poetry anytime you'd like. And if, if there's anything like that, that you'd like to bring to the wrapping up of our time, yeah. I'd, I'd just really appreciate it. I, do, I have a poem and I also have um, uh, 
uh, I'm thinking about what you said about the, the teenager in the, the kitchen and the, you know, the, where the attention goes. And, um, and I would say, yeah, the kitchen's probably, um, there's a learning that hasn't happened already and you're seeing that there and the fact that that it is very easy for people to just leave their things lying around and not consider that there are others in their midst and i i i think that in a in the village setting if you will or in the indigenous tribal ways that this behavior is caught on much earlier but there's there is the way of seeing that you speak about and so I'll just say this, that you look at a forest and the indigenous person from the place, mean, I'm going to mean that from someone who's from that place, extends their hand and says, these are my relatives. And speaking of the trees, whereas uh, is very easy for um, the, the colonial way of viewing things, well, those are resources. And we have it in the language of natural resources and human resources. They're the same thing. It means those natural resources and human resources that serve me or my agenda or my corporate visions or all of that, right? So it's very much about the way of seeing. Is the world alive? And if so, well, how can I tell by your behavior? Or, you know, how can I tell that you're aware of others? So, so that's, that's a big part of the education that I don't think that we do learn, um, in spite of the fact that we're trying to uh, teach people things. But I think our modeling is the biggest teacher. And so we shouldn't be surprised then. We shouldn't be surprised. So I have a poem for you and it's called Imagine. Imagine this, you are born inside a mud and grass hut. Breath fills your lungs, life. You hear soft voices, hands reach out to hold you close, skin, breast, milk. Mother, you are given a name, binding you to your purpose and lineage. You are firmly rooted, home. The gauzy blur before your newborn eyes slowly reveals the many who have awaited you. Village, you are given stories to help you to see and obey the natural order, to help you choose right living wisdom the natural order surrounds you you are embedded this is how it is belonging forest mountain river and creature everything speaks the language of life creation you are taught how you are inseparable from the web of life how all things are joined kinship you learn to pay heed, to listen to the land, to the winds and seasons, to the needs of all life. Respect. Your people help you to cultivate the capacity for humility, reverence, courtesy, and obligation. Etiquette. Elders instruct you, readying you so that one day you may become an adult elder ancestor. Continuum. You learn to speak relationally. You learn to bring attentiveness to how language lives. Vigilance. You tend to what matters so that life can be nurtured by how you live your days. Stewardship. And if your story is more lostness and tragedy than it is sanity and coherence, you work to remember redemption, trauma 
does not consign you to choose between victim and oppressor. You are capable of more human. Imagine this, from your grief and labors, you can craft a different life for those to inherit this world. Benediction. Rochelle Lamb, um, an absolute pleasure to make your acquaintance and to be able to uh, take a stroll through the garden of your heart and your mind and your presence today. Um, I knew it was going to be good and, and indeed. You know, I'm, I'm finding myself in stillness, and it's a rich and wonderful stillness uh, here at the end. I, I don't have a lot of words, um, but I have a deep appreciation for our time together and for what you've had to share with us. Thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm curious, Rochelle, if you could um, make it easy for people to reach out to find out more about you, whatever work you might do. Can you say something about that? Sure. I have a website like uh, everybody else does, rochellelam.com. And, uh, you know, I do work one-on-one -on -one with people and, uh, and I have online courses, you know. Um, yeah, I have one coming up in September. And, uh, yeah, Zoom, like everybody else. And, uh, yeah, and I, I think that's all I can think of right now. Um, okay. I also do have a, on Facebook, I, I'm known as the Poetess, so um, I can provide a link to that. That's where I put the poetry, yeah. All right, I'm happy to include um, both the links you've just mentioned and anything else you'd like included in the show notes sure. in this conversation today. And once again, just thank you so much for your original reaching out and then for just really a wonderful and, and rich conversation today. It's been wonderful. Well, thank you too, Dean. It's really been a pleasure and I'm glad I reached out to you. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for watching another episode of the Poetry of Predicament podcast produced by Dean Walker and the Living Resilience Alliance. www.livingresilience.com Net. Music today from Michael Hedges, as always, and also Port Blue into the Sea. Also available on our website, www.livingresilience.net, is a wide array of articles, online learning series, arranging group and individual resilience coaching, and sign up for our Every Other Tuesday free support group that we call Safe Circle Calls.